Hey, Andre, are you ready to talk trucks for TFL's newest podcast, TFL Talking Trucks? Heck yeah, I'm ready, Roman. Well, guys, welcome to our very first podcast. And on the phone, because we're practicing social distancing, is our man, Mr. Truck, Ken Sundling. Say hi, Kent. Hey, I'm here. Hey, Ken's here. Well, he's not here. He's like 60 miles away, which is <laughs> uh, great for social distancing. And on this show, guys, we're going to talk about the Ike Gauntlet. We're going to talk about uh, how it started, um, how it became the world's toughest towing test. We're going to talk about uh, some of the best and worst trucks that we've run up the world's toughest towing test. We're going to talk about the Gold Hitch. And at the end of this podcast, we're going to answer your questions because you guys have a lot of questions about trucks. And if you're watching this on our TFL Truck now channel then uh, you can also listen to it in your car uh, there'll be a link in the description of the video where you can pick up the podcast and listen to it in your car or on your run or just you know if you don't want to watch it on video just sitting at home with your earphones on so boys ready to get started heck yeah all right oh i'm ready all right let's start this ken so ken let's talk about the ike gauntlet how did it start it was me and you right yeah it was uh, we were talking at the denver auto show and we were looking at a diesel colorado i think and I said, hey, you know, we ought to do a video together. And so you thought that was a good idea. And so then you you had a 3500, a dually ram. Yep. And I took us up to Trans West, and we got one of their big horse traders, like we're using now, the big living quarters, and we headed up the mountains. And that was a place that I was telling you about that I've done several times is up, uh, you know, the tunnels, Eisenhower and Johnson, and going up and down that hill. So we did that. We went down the hill and... And it was interesting. You thought it was a good place to go. Now it says uh, runaway truck ramp, a half we got a mile. More than that. We got two good duels. We got 10, 10, disc, we got 10 wheels on the ground. We don't want to use that runaway truck ramp. That's not no. good because you no. said there's like eight feet of sand and it'll stop you. Very deep, yes. It stops you very fast. You got to have some weight to actually plow through that and then come through it. But something like this, we would stop so fast, I think we would probably become good ornaments. <laughs> and then, you know, we turned around the bottom, I think, by Lake Dillon. And the only thing that happened was. I couldn't find a place to turn around the big trader, so I did a U-turn in the middle of the road, and it knocked the cap off the black uh, tank on the living quarters, which is no I, expense. So I, 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 think, started. I think we had a lot of those incidents over the years. And, and Mr. Chuck, I, I think I want to make one correction, because if I remember right, uh, I've been the managing editor of TFL Truck for about six years, maybe six and a half, and this was before that. So this must have been before the Chevy Colorado diesel ever existed. Yeah, it was like 1963. <laughs> <laughs> no. Really? Because I remember that's when we first started talking about doing something together. It was at that uh, auto show, and we both were staring at that Colorado diesel. Anyway. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. That's, that's, no, that's it, how it, I was, it, it was a long time ago, and yes. we had, you're right, we had a Ram 3500, and then you got us a. Uh, uh, it was a Cimarron, right, with living quarters. Yeah, it was a big, yeah, yeah. very long Cimarron, probably real similar to what we just used recently. Yep, and I remember uh, the, you know. the trailer cost like 179000 and the truck was like 60000 which was crazy. And then, you know, to be fair, we have to give props to Mike Levine, who, of course, is now over at Ford. But at the time, uh, he was running a, a, a very similar test up the Ike Gauntlet, which he called um, Hurt Locker. the Hurt Locker, yeah, yeah. for pickup trucks, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah I, was in the, I was in the middle of that one, too, and, we, you know, that's... I was helping them quite a few years before you guys came into existence. And, and it was, you know, this worked out much better because we're almost neighbors. We're close enough. It worked out well for both of us, I think. But, you know, and then we came back up the hill. And I don't remember, uh, you know, it was an interesting run, and it showed us a lot of things. And then I don't remember any, any major things happening. It was just we weren't really testing anything at the time or taking stats. We were just kind of getting a feel for what it was like to climb that big hill, 11%, 11,000, uh, 7%, 11,000 feet. And, yeah. you know, up and down. So it was a good experience. And, I, and as I recall, too, I think it was Nathan that came up with the name, the Ike Gauntlet. Absolutely. Yep, that's right. Uh, Mike called it the Hurt Locker. We decided to rebrand it. Uh, when we did it, we actually didn't score the thing. We just ran it up and down the big mountain just to see how the truck did. So we didn't have any scoring. We didn't have any brake applications. All of that uh, came later. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it was pretty obvious that it was a um, winner of an idea because I remember when we published that video, you know, sometimes videos do really well. And that one, I think, went like, you know, 100,000 right away, which is a, a lot of views. And our producer, Tommy, over there says that that video was uh, uploaded and published in 2013. So we must have started this in 2013, seven years ago now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's what I remember. Yeah, all right. Yeah, um, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. and that, that was uh, – so nice that it was three lanes, which is what we really need on a on a test run. 
because you know our big priority was safety so it worked out to be a very good drive yeah and then over the years you know the scoring of the ike was something that we i think helped develop not just the three of us in here but also our viewers because you know we would publish the video and they would say you guys need to somehow figure out how to score it uh, and then we eventually, you know, figure out a system of how to score each truck on the way up. And you should talk about that, Andre. What do we come up with? Yeah, well, first of all, let's define the eye gauntlet, right? Yeah. I can't mention already. So 11,000 feet is the top of the mountain. And yep. this is I-70. And the reason why we called it the eye gauntlet, uh, the name that Nathan Adlin came up with, is because Eisenhower Johnson Tunnels. Um, and Ike so, was the nickname of Eisenhower. So we drive a, a truck full throttle from uh, Silverthorne, Colorado, up to the top of the tunnel. And how long is that stretch, Andre? That's exactly eight miles and from the merge lane all the way to the top. And, Kent, how steep is that road? Well, it uh, was uh, 7%. 7% so grade, it, which is the yeah, steepest allowable grade, grade, right, on U.S. highways. Yeah, it, it is uh, It is uh, about the highest you can get on an interstate, and it... Uh, you know, it has, it has its up and down. So it's a really good test for a truck because you go up a steep part and you level off, you go up a steep part. And, and yeah, and then, you know, it's always a different weather pattern on each side of that tunnel. So weather always played a part in the Ike Gauntlet, too, whether it's going to be good or bad. And we end up testing a lot of trucks in the winter. Yeah, yeah. and I think the other thing that's cool about it is uh, it's very uh, severe, right? On the way down, I think there are at least two runaway truck ramps mm-hmm. because you're going <laughs> you're going at such a steep angle. So it's really pushing the truck on the way up. You know, for the most part, we run it, at least we used to run it, full throttle if we could, uh, mm-hmm. especially on some of the bigger trucks when we're talking about the heavy-duty trucks uh, and when we're towing, you know, the maximum amount of weight. Uh, it's kind of fun going up there and looking, you know, like uh, – we're semi dr- semi truck drivers, and by the way, Kent's the only one of the three of us who has a commercial driver's license. So when we get into the big rig trucks, it's Kent that's doing the driving. Yeah, absolutely, with the big weights. Yeah, and what's happening to your dr- your commercial license, Andre? You started uh, it the process, but yes, uh, as in the process of getting my commercial CDL a commercial driver's license, I realized that it's a incredibly actually a really big commitment because. Yes, I did the written tests, yep. and I studied for them, and I read the books, and um, I got my medical exam and all that stuff. But actually, the practical part of it is a big step, too. It's not just you know something, especially for a big rig like a semi would be. It's not something you can just jump in and say, let's go for a ride. Um, so I think in order for me to get my license uh, officially and um, get it done all the way, I actually need to uh, actually get some hands-on experience. Yeah, so you're still working on that um, in between making videos and writing out on the website and taking care of your family and traveling around the world. You know, there's just a lot going on. So that's one of the reasons that Andre has yet to cross that line, but I'm sure he'll do it at some point, right? Yeah, and actually I've met some good uh, guys. I've met several different uh, CDL driving schools. One of them is Southwest. Uh, They're based uh, out of Phoenix and also have an office in Las Vegas. So there's a lot of good, uh, um, really, resources to get this done. Uh, but you asked me about scoring, right? Yeah. So let's, let's quickly go over the iGauntlet, which is the world's toughest towing test. And the reason why it is the world's toughest is because there is less air density up at elevation like this. The grade is very steep, as like we said. And the engines struggle to build power. And we do a couple things on this test. So on the downhill, we measure brake applications. So basically, we don't want to have a runaway truck, like you talked about, the runaway truck ramps. And we want to keep the speed between 50 miles an hour and 60 miles an hour, which is the speed limit. And every time we touch the brakes to slow down the truck, we, it's basically uh, we take off a point. And the maximum points on the downhill is 25. Every brake application, we subtract a point, and we compare all the trucks. On the way up the mountain, it's two things. Time, so we time every truck on the way up, and also fuel efficiency as reported by the trip meter. And how come we don't measure the fuel at the pump? Uh, because there's no pump at the top of the mountain. <laughs> That's that <laughs> yeah, simple, yeah. No, no truck stops along I-70 in the mountains like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we couldn't get an accurate reading because we would have to drive it someplace else, and by that point it would basically change the uh, – test to to an extent where we couldn't use that number as a realistic 
uh, number for you guys. Um, so now that we've defined it, I think, boys, we should take a kind of a walk down memory lane and talk about some of the best and worst hikes that we've done. Uh, and you guys have pretty much done most of them. I've been kind of, I started early and then I kind of dropped out and I, I kind of come back, but it's me, mainly you two guys and Nathan. Uh, so let me go through and ask each of you, Andre, what's the, let's start with the best and we'll go to the worst. What's the best hike that you ran? The best hike, um, I think, uh, I judge it by how stressed out I was. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the best, actually, um, and uh, when I say stressed out, it's kind of good stress. But like Mr. Chuck mentioned, we run most of our eye gauntlets in the winter because this is when the brand-new trucks show up. And my most memorable one, I think, was this year, um, actually a few months ago, for 2020 heavy-duty trucks because we were on the cusp of a four-day snowstorm. So I, I called Mr. Truck the night before. I said, okay, the trailer is loaded. We're using a Caterpillar excavator. And the truck, we need to hook up the truck. And if we don't do it today, we are going to have to wait four days before the snow is over and starts to melt and kind of the road is clear. And by then we may lose the truck because we only have the truck for about a week or two. And uh, we, uh, we started to run in the Ford F-350 2020 model diesel. This is a 6.7 liter turbo diesel. And I remember... Um, I had a couple of cameras with me. I always carry my gear set, my video cameras with me. And I, I, I decided to start the downhill without waiting for the videographers because the snow was coming so fast and I could, we could see the clouds moving in. So guys, the latest right now is we tried cruise control. The truck was accelerating a little bit. Yeah. To between, we started at 35, it went up to 40. So we had to use a brake. So that was one brake application there. And now we're using automatic exhaust brake, exactly. which is supposed to help us slow down and keep maintain the speed. And we su did a successful run. It was very kind of stressful, but everything worked for us. You know, the downhill portion, we measured the performance of the trucks. And on the way up, um, Mr. Truck was able to just put the hammer down uh, full speed uh, because we're hauling 30,000 pounds with these big dualies now. And... Um, and at the end, we had a successful video. I think the video we published on YouTube on our channel, TFL Truck, uh, is about 700,000 views now. Yeah, that's always very um, gratifying when you guys watch the video. Ken, what was the best uh, Ike gauntlet that you remember? Well, the, <laughs> the funnest one for me was when I you know, had that orange trailer that we used for a while from my traders, and we had the half track on there. Yeah, I was going to say the half track. That was <laughs> yeah, we that was such a that was a, just a good look to it. And then we had quite the event uh, loading it. You know, we it wouldn't start. We had to, to try to scrounge up some gasoline, and we had to kind of. Uh, uh, Nathan ran along the side pouring gas in carburetor while I was kind of running up the ramps on a trailer. I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. This, this was a World War II white half track that was. Uh, uh, owned by one of your friends who, who lent it to us so that we could actually get some weight on the thing. And half tracks are heavy because they have uh, big plates of steel on them. And keep, tank treads. Yeah, to keep bullets from going oh, yeah. through them. And you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. I remember that there's a video that we did where actually Nathan running alongside the half track trying to start it, well, trying to keep it running, lit himself and the half track on fire. <laughs> It's pretty yeah, funny now, but yeah. back then probably wasn't that funny. <laughs> well, I don't know that uh, Nathan thought it was funny, but it was it was quite the deal. But we got it loaded, and we made the run, and it was it was great. Visual effects were great, and it was just fun uh, doing that. And you know, it's it's always interesting. I don't remember snowing on that time on us, but usually it did. And that's what's really good about Andre and I working together. He knows all the stats. He knows everything. And in those winter times, especially with the heavy duty trucks, you get really stressed. And you're concentrating so much on traffic, on you know whether wheels are slipping, if it's ice, and so that works out really well that I can concentrate on driving and let Andre, you know, talk about the stats and stuff. But that one uh, was, was what I remember the most. But the most scary one is with you, Roman. That's when we took the, with the K20 or K10 big green, and I don't remember if that was an '84 or an '80. Five, whatever year it was, eighty-five, and we we did that uh, that I got on with it. And I think you pulled it there with the Raptor because we didn't get some wire issues on that K10, and it uh, 
couldn't get the light to work. We worked on that in a snowstorm, another snowstorm. <laughs> and I worked on the wire and worked on the wire. And we finally got to the point where we had brakes and we had some tail lights. So we were tickled and we were, the sun was going down. And we had to fight against that. We got up there and went down the hill. And it was pretty scary because the steering was pretty wild. I was barely keeping it in the lines because the steering wheel was moving about six inches every time I touched it. And I was telling you, I was asking if you were a religious man because it was, <laughs> we were watching the runaway ramps on the way down. And, and yeah, I, and then we, we made it back up. Of course, we didn't go very fast. I don't know if we ever got out of third gear going back up or even second. So, Roman, are you a religious man? I am. <laughs> well, you know what to do. Yeah. I'm watching the RPMs. And... I'll be so happy when we're at the bottom of this hill. Oh, man, we worked on this in the snow all day. I am soaked to the bone. Yeah, you must be cold. Oh, get, do we have a heater in this thing? Did they make that yeah, in 1985? Yeah, we have a heater, and it works. <laughs> this is one of those, don't try this at home unless your name happens to be Mr. Truck. Yeah. But uh, that one was a little more on the scary side. I wouldn't call it the worst hike, but that was the one. Oh, that, I call uh, it the worst hike. I was clenching <laughs> my, my butt cheeks the whole way down. You were sweating. I was clenching. It was quite the show. I uh, was chasing you guys in the, in the yeah, chase truck. Yeah, keep in mind, guys, this uh, K10 uh, that we have is an 85 square body Chevy uh, with uh, like a six inch lift uh, and mud terrain <laughs> tires. It was, it was, you know, we have these like unwritten rules at TFL and that fostered the rule. Never run the Ike in a classic truck. It's just not good. <laughs> and you're right. The steering was bad. The suspension was bad. The tires were bad. Uh, you had no brakes? We had brakes. and barely <laughs> well, we had brakes, brakes finally, yeah. Yes. Barely brake lights. Uh, but, yeah, and, and I remember that, like, the, w- the way that it was wired to – to pull that trailer was like somebody had, you know, wired it in third grade, right? It was like I mean, a nest. Yeah, it was like a nest of wires under <laughs> the thing. It was all pretty, pretty, pretty terrifying. And uh, we won't do that again, Kent. Okay. And it, was you, awesome. it was kind of fun, but yeah, it was scary. And you guys, by the way, might be wondering uh, what trucks are the best. You know, we'll get to that. So this is a good long podcast so stay tuned for that we'll we'll talk about specific new trucks uh but we're kind of going down memory lane here talking about the best and the worst i think that was definitely the worst how about you andre what was your worst Ooh, my worst yeah the one my worst well there's one the the worst one has to be the one with the f-250 where we didn't even get to the ike that was you and kent yeah i was gonna (laughs) i was gonna say some of my worst ones were unpredictable where we it was out of our control basically so we did have one instance where Mr. Chuck and I were in the white, I think it was, what, the 2017 F-250 with a 6.2-liter gas V8, so it's a gas-powered truck, and we were fully loaded. Yeah. Most of our eye gauntlets, we were pushing the trucks to the limit. I think that that, that um, half-track was like 14,000 pounds, wasn't it, Kent? Was that right, or 17? Yeah, very, yes, yeah. yes. It was that's very heavy. Too. Yeah, so these, yeah. Are, these are very... Heavy loads. Yeah, so you're in the, you're in this F250, brand new, like out of the factory, brand new. Yeah, brand new, just a couple thousand miles on this truck, and we're towing a different trailer this time. Uh, we're comparing three quarter ton trucks, basically the F250 versus the 2500s, and uh, I think we had uh, another truck basically on one of those tilt trailers in the back. Yeah, my my truck was on there for weight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that was the ballast and. We always say if a truck does well on the I Gauntlet, it will do any, well anywhere because we're pushing these trucks within an inch of what they're capable of. And we kind of have a loud bang on the way to up the mountain. This is before we actually got to the very start of the climb, the I Gauntlet climb. And then I saw something uh, behind us, a piece of what looked like a piece of tire, but it turned out to be a belt. Yep. The serpentine belt went. And then I saw a lot of water dripping. Uh, it was coolant. And we had to pull over. Uh, and we basically what happened was it was a water pump failure. So the water pump seized or the pulley maybe on it seized. And it, it was kind of a summer. It, it was a summer day. It was really warm. Okay, guys, we had some sort of a breakdown. We're on the way, on the way to the uh, eye gauntlet. See the fluid going yeah, across the road? Yeah, I see it. I see it. It felt almost like a belt failure. Yeah, uh, came but out it's back. really weird. And then, it looked like uh, little crunches of rubber coming out the back of the trailer. I thought it was a it tire. It says charging system now. Hit okay. And see that belt may have also ran the fan. There's the belt's gone off the alternator, so we would have lost the fan too. Yeah, the fan pieces are here. Yeah. Wow, did the fan blow apart? Is that what happened? And then we got the truck, you know, towed 
uh, the Ford, you know, got it. They fixed it. They gave us the same truck back yeah, after it had the I pump. Gotta, I got to tell you, I got to thank Mike Levine and, and Ford. the Ford team. Yeah, yeah, the Ford team because, you know, that truck had a catastrophic failure. They went back and they said basically what happened was that the uh, fan broke, right? And then the, then, well, the, then the broken fan took out the belt. Yeah, cut the belt. belt and yes. the, the belt, of course, you know, seized the water pump. And you had this catastrophic failure of a bunch of – so. But the engine was running. The engine was still running. Yeah. And we had, to <laughs> shut, we had to shut it off, yeah. you know, because the engine wanted to keep going. Yeah. It just – Mr. Chuck had no power steering, no cooling. <laughs> the truck yeah. was basically done. Yeah, but it's – we're on a go dangerous ahead. part of I-72. We're on a curve. A lot of truck traffic coming right next to us. We had to unload my truck and up to the trailer. So we did all that. I kept telling Andre, now, if I, if I yell at you, you jump off the trailer into the ditch because that means somebody's coming right at us. <laughs> now, if I see a truck coming and it's going to hit us, I'm going to honk my horn. That means brace for impact or get the hell out of the way. It was spooky. You know, and, and we were up the side of the road, but that road was really a lot of traffic, a lot of big semis coming very close to us. So we were always trying to be as cautious as we can, and mm -hmm. we've done that. We've had some situations where, you know, we, we did safety first, and we did all the right things, and, you know, we, that's what gets you down and get back home. And then to the credit of Ford, they, they, you know, they took the truck, they diagnosed it, and they gave us another one. No, the same truck, the but same fixed. truck fixed, yeah, that we, yeah. we were able to run. So And they did, and, and we had a successful run after that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and there was a couple of other trucks, like the Ram Hemi 2500. If you remember, I think you were there. This was about five years ago. Went super slow up the mountain. It was a gas-powered truck, and we couldn't quite understand what was happening. So in the end, after you know a lot of checking and checking all the stats, we figured out that the truck was kind of derating itself. It was trying to save itself. And we had like a very slow time. If I remember correctly, it was near 12 minutes. Keep in mind, if you're maintaining speed limit up the Ike gauntlet, eight-minute run should be the perfect run. So, so the fact that that was slow, that was probably my worst feeling because we didn't know what was happening. We actually did it twice. Remember that? We redid yeah. it and um, got the same result. So, so those are the, some of my negative memories. When, when you say when, derating, basically the truck goes into slid pole mode. Where it, kind of safety mode. Yeah, yes. safety mode where it doesn't give you all the power so it doesn't burn up the engine. So, Kent, let's talk about, over the years, the things that uh, the manufacturers have done that we kind of complained about that have gotten better. Do you have any ideas, like when we were first running these things, what what were some things that were you know pretty terrifying that are pretty good now? Well, there, yeah, there's been so many changes. I know on the Ford, when a 10-speed came out, on the 150, it wouldn't grade shift very well. And we thought, well, it's not getting enough RPMs because there's so many gears so close together. And we talked about that, and the, and, it, and they actually changed that on a couple of the engines, one on the, uh, the Expedition, I think the Platinum, and, and the high-end uh, 150 that has that Raptor engine. They did make changes to calibration. And we had the same kind of thing on the Ford Diesel. The Diesel went into all kinds of lip modes. It was double shifting uh, coming down the hill, after it would hit the red line, it would shift again, and it was that was kind of scary. But it it went into limp mode also. We had to kind of walk it down the mountain with that, and uh, of course that was a, it was like a lot of things we get right after a launch. So it was you know uh, a pre production model, and we got down there and called Ford, and the same kind of thing. They took it back, and then they did that calibration that they were planning on doing to the production models, and we took it back to mountain, and it worked well. So that happens, and you know there's. There's been a few other things. A lot of it has to do with transmissions and shifting and, and, and brake, those kind of things. It's just, you know, like braking. I remember when I first met Andre, he didn't speak any English. He's always checking the brakes <laughs> on the trailer with his thermometer. And I thought, what in the world? You know, he had his Russian hat on and never spoke. I never heard a single word of English for a long time from that guy. So that, that was interesting. But uh, So, so i got to tell you guys, one of the things that Kent does uh, both in the videos and in real life is when, when he sees a problem with the truck, he will let the – Manufacturers know, and it's not just like a. He's not shy. No, there's not a polite email like "Dear Sir, just want to give you a heads up." He'll go up to the engineer and you know, point blank range. He'll let them know. And one, of, I think one of the things that you've actually gotten them to change, and this is very Kent centric talk, so I'm going to do this with a grain of salt. The old, uh, when I say old, last year's F two fifty and three fifty were very tall, and so 
Ken, I, if I recall, you said something like a certain type of dog in heat, right? That was that was <laughs> that was how you described it. And yeah. lo, lo and behold, the 2020 F two fifty is it's lowered. Is lowered. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. GM lowered theirs an inch too because I complained a lot. I said that's fine. If somebody wants to lift the truck, they can lift it. If they want to pull traders, they need it lower. Majority of people pull traders, so that's kind of the way I leaned with it. Is you know we always pull traders with these trucks because you most people buying a truck can't go down and bring the trader to the dealership. So we do all that stuff with trailers, and that's that's how that works out. Yeah, and I'm amazed. You know, I've got a few of them to change some things over the years. You know, it's just like me going to the to the uh, auto show and climbing underneath there and getting in a lot of trouble. I'm always trying to figure out what they're up to. <laughs> yeah, I think and, I think and, probably the biggest thing you've changed is uh, magic spring dust. Right when we first started this, <laughs> what would happen is. A manufacturer would let's let's say Chevy would say they have a tow rating of eight thousand pounds on their fifteen hundred, uh, and that was up from seventy five hundred. And lo and behold, the next day Ford would send out a press release saying, "Oh, our F one fifty now does eighty five hundred pounds," without making any changes to the truck, just in a press release. And you know, you call that magic spring dust, right? Because basically, what they were doing is it was a who's is longer contest, and manufacturers know that the more the truck tows, the more likely they're going to sell it. And what they ended up doing eventually was conforming to a set of standards put out by the Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, and I think I think a lot of what you did and what Andre did at the same time caused it. Want, want to explain to him what SAE is and how it works? J twenty eight zero. What is it, Andre? Seven. Twenty eight zero seven. Yeah. yeah. You, you want to explain that, Andre? Yeah, just really quickly. Uh, Basically, Society of Automotive Engineers has been around for many years. SAE. Um, SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers. And it's basically people from all the manufacturers coming together. Engineers. Engineers. And deciding on a set of testing parameters, standards. And uh, that standard, the 2807, has been around for many years. But now they're all saying we're conforming to it. We, we are testing the trucks to that um, standard, yep. and it involves um, anything from braking, uh, being on a grade, and you know putting it in park, making sure the transmission can hold the weight. And you know before I, before I let you go too far, if you're really interested in that, Tommy did a great video. It's up on TFL Truck on yes. J2807. So go to TFL Truck, put in J2807, and you will see what that set of standards actually involved. Yeah, Tommy was yeah, there at the that, proving grounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that was good. I remember that. It was a very good video. All right, boys, I think it's time to what? talk about the Gold Hitch Awards. Yes. Um, and let's, let's, why don't you define the Gold Hitch Awards, Andre, and what those are? So we talked about the iGauntlet yep. and the scoring system. Yep. So we've been scoring these trucks, and then we wanted to use those scores based on what we did on the mountain and actually award the best towing truck in every category. So I'm talking about midsize, smaller trucks, the full-size half-ton trucks, which is like the F-150 or the Chevy Silverado 1500, and the heavy-duty trucks that we discussed. And the Gold Hitch Award we would you know, present to each manufacturer. And it, it's not just the scoring. The scoring is a huge part of it on the Ike. We also measured fuel economy on our MPG loop, which is basically a flat highway, just a regular highway, not a mountain climb. And also some of our judgment calls. You know, We would get together in the room and we would vote based on the scoring on the Ike and, of course, at fuel economy and other parameters. And we would give these awards, and we've been doing it for five years. And a lot of manufacturers like Ford, GM, Ram uh, recognized it. Yeah, right? they're, they're using it in some of their marketing terms and on their websites. Yeah, they're using it to promote the fact that they want it, like you know, they would do with Motor Trend, Car Truck of the Year. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to go into all the winners and, and losers, but I do want to talk about the most memorable ones. So, Kent, um, what's the most memorable Gold Hitch winner? Uh, and we'll do the winners first, and we'll leave the losers later, because I've got a couple ideas of pretty good doghouse <laughs> trucks that didn't do so well. What, what, what's, what's like a standout truck for you that really kind of blew you away going up uh, the I gauntlet and then ended up winning the Gold Hitch Award? Well, the diesel has always been so, so powerful and so fast, but, you know, and a few of the bigger gas engines have always impressed me. But, you know, it's it's uh, even like the, when the Colorado came out with the diesel. Yep, the and, little baby uh, diesel. Called? Yeah, and that and an off-road package that it had. Yep, I the ZR2. With, yeah, the ZR2 and how well it climbed the hill. And, and then I've been disappointed in some of the other diesels, how they didn't climb the hill very well. So, I mean, I think back, my goodness, what has that been? They have six or seven. How many of these gold hitch awards have we had? Yeah, probably at least it, half a dozen now. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And we've always had, uh, you know, 
interesting loads on them back when we had that that Bronco on it, and we had your Lincoln on it. So a lot, a lot of the runs we've done up and down that hill have been have been really interesting. It's hard to pick one out that really sticks out. I mean, it's uh, we've always kind of looked at the we got used to the, the heavy duty diesels and how fast they were, and then when a half ton diesel would come out, we were kind of disappointed because it, it was made for fuel mileage, not really speed. And so they all looked like dogs compared to their big brothers. Yeah, the one that and, the, the, the one that really uh, impressed me, and this is really, I think, the first truck that uh, we couldn't go full throttle up the hill uh, with its max load because it it actually what we do on the Ike Gauntlet is we maintain the speed limit. So if we exceed the speed limit, we have to, or you have to, if you're driving, uh, basically get off, slow the, down, slow down. Yeah. And, and the two uh, F-150s, both the EcoBoost, right, the the smaller 2.7 and then the bigger 3.5 were, the, I think, the first two trucks uh, that just blew away uh, uh, the time on that mountain. If we were to go full throttle the whole way up, they would exceed the eight-minute time by a significant margin, getting us into, you know, some very illegal territory, pulling up to, what, 12,000 feet and pulling, you know, a boatload of weight. That's pretty impressive. And um, and yeah, absolutely. And my favorite is was actually um, not my favorite, but also uh, the best gold hitch winner in my opinion was last year, 2019 half ton trucks. These are the full size trucks, and we tested three of them at the same time. We had an F-150 with the EcoBoost, uh, which is a twin turbo 3.5 liter, the GMC 1500 with a big 6.2 liter gas V8, and the Ram with a 5.7 liter Hemi gas V8. And we had all of them. They were all red, if you remember. Uh, and it's really hard to get all these trucks together at the same time. For us, we're not in Detroit. We're not in Los Angeles. But, but these manufacturers, you know, pay attention, and uh, we're able to get these trucks. And the three trucks were within 10 points of each other. I mean, it was a very close contest. I remember we were arguing about this after we saw all the results. They performed about the same way on the way down, about 10 brake applications, all three of them. And on the way up, they were all within a couple of seconds of each other, around eight minutes. And the deciding factor was really the fuel efficiency reported by the truck and some of our opinions. So Ram 1500 won that contest that year. Yeah, and uh, in a way, for me, the, the, the one that's in the doghouse is also the Ram 1500, but not the one with the Hemi, the one with the Pentastar. Yes. Uh, that's a, a, a truck that has uh, derated itself. You, we talked about this a little bit. And up. actually was actually getting to overheat. Getting to overheat, yeah. yeah that, that engine just does not perform well uh, for that size of a truck. It's the same engine that they now put in the Gladiator, but it's a much smaller truck, and it works fine in that truck. But in the half ton, uh, not not glorious. So let's talk about, Ken, some of your favorite technologies. Over the years, the technology that these trucks have has really evolved. So let's talk about two things, grade shifting, uh, and um, w- with the diesels, you know where they actually um, break using the, the, the turbo. So uh, how have you seen that evolve over the years? I remember when we first started this, you know, we would count brake applications, and we'd be like in double-digit numbers, right? 2011. Yeah, yeah, which is a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's, that they, they've learned, the, the manufacturers learned a lot about grade shifting and how to keep the RPMs up. Which on a diesel, you know, it helps the turbo on the, if you can keep the RPMs up, and it helps the grade shifting because all that, you know, keeps some of the heat down and it gives those RPMs, which gives you more braking. And they, they've all improved. Now, it amazes me now. I mean, the Ford, like I said earlier, the 10 speed did really well after they did a different program on it. And, and so sometimes the six speed from a Ram or even an eight speed will stop at the same amount of, uh, or even better going down the hill in these 10 speeds. That always amazed me. My favorite thing is the adaptive cruise control, which we uh, proved in one of the last hikes we did. One of them had it, and the other two didn't. And you didn't touch the brakes. You didn't touch anything but the steering wheel. It was amazing to watch how it worked. It gives you that safe feeling coming down the hill when all you got to do is steer, and you're not worried about overheating your brakes. And that adaptive steering on the heavy duty also breaks the trailer, which is a big deal. And that's, that, that's always impressed me. But the turbos have gotten better. But all that is just getting better, and I think they're going to part, they're going to program these ten speeds a little better, and they'll they'll come to their capacity. They always have a hard time going down the hill with brake applications, but they go up the hill faster than the other ones. So because of that closeness of the gears. And Andrew, I'm going to take a guess at one of your favorite new tech features is the cameras, right? You're big on those. Well, yeah. So we started what six years ago, seven yeah. years ago, like we said at the beginning of the show. 
And back then, you know, we were just happy to count brake applications and going up the mountain. And as the years progressed, it's amazing how much more technology these trucks have received. Uh, I'm a tech guy, you're, you're right. Um, and now we have 360-degree cameras. Uh, Ford has, you know, the assist system for backing up a trailer. Now even on their heaviest trucks, the F-350 and F-450, they call it the Trailer Pro Backup Assist. And a lot of people make fun of that system saying, if you cannot back up a trailer, you shouldn't do it. Uh, but actually, it's a helpful system that for a beginner works really well. And, of course, um, all the views. Now you can put a camera on the back of the trailer, right? You can see behind the trailer. GM has the invisible trailer thing <laughs> where you can actually set it up a, a camera that actually projects on your center console. Uh, basically makes your trailer invisible. You can see through it. Or you can, go, you can go the other way. You can put a camera in your trailer. Yes, and you can see what's inside of it. Yeah, see how the horses are doing. Well, actually, you and Tommy went to the GMC event last year, and GM did this thing where they had a camouflage GMC Canyon stuck inside the trailer. Yeah, and we saw see. it through, the, through their camera system. So, and all these systems, and that's not just about the cameras. Uh, now, all the mirrors are, you know, power folding, power extendable. Uh, you can adjust everything better. Um, you know, Ram has that air suspension on their heavy-duty trucks uh, that you can level it out. Uh, the, the amount of technology and the, and the prices are going up, right? Yeah. I mean, you have all these uh, technologies, but now the average price of a dually truck for heavy-duty is about $80,000 that we're testing. Yeah, and we're certainly approaching the $100,000 truck, aren't we, Kent? Well, yeah, and a lot of that has to do with the new federal regulations, the new safety things. I mean, I keep saying it's so hard. You, you have to try really hard to wreck the truck anymore with lane keep and all the automatic systems that come on, the one that stops you, the cars in front of you. I mean, it's amazing. And, of course, all that costs money, just like what the emissions have done with what they keep making these cleaner engines. So, yeah, all that's driving the price up. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so much safer than they ever have been. And uh, their ABS has improved. Everything on those trucks is just amazing how well. Yeah, and tra trailer sway has gotten to be less of a problem because mm -hmm. the truck now mitigates for it. And eventually, you did some testing on this. The trailer, the newest trailers will have their own trailer sway controls so they can actually stop from swaying. It's, you know, it's becoming, oh, yeah. it's becoming much, much better. And uh, you, Roman, you interviewed the GM engineer about the improving the braking system on the trailer, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it just keeps going. And I think part of the uh, story is that the pickup truck is becoming more of an everyday vehicle for a lot of people, right? Right. It's becoming the family vehicle, and you want it comfortable, you want it luxurious, you want it technology-laden, you want it easy to use, and all these things add money, uh, but also safety. Yeah, and if, if, well, yeah. We, if we actually get through this year, which, which is turning out to be a difficult year, uh -huh. we're going to see the advent of the electric trucks, right? So we've yeah. got a whole bunch of electric trucks coming from GM with the new Hummer, to Ford with their F-150 electric, to Rivian, to, uh, well, there's just a, there's just a Bollinger, whole. Bollinger, everybody. Everybody's yeah. coming out. Yeah, and, yeah. and from the testing we've done on our Tesla Model X, um, electric trucks don't tow very well. Or they do tow very well, but not for very long. <laughs> and then it takes a long time to recharge them. Yeah, they're excellent at towing, yeah. but not long distance. All right, in the last uh, couple of minutes we have here, guys, we got a bunch of questions that you guys sent us. And if you're, by the way, if you're interested in us answering your questions personally, just email us at ask at TFL Truck. Uh, we'll correlate these questions, and then we will um, – read them on the podcast and answer them. So, Andre, you've got a bunch of questions. I'll just shut up. You guys, you, you read them. Can't you answer them? And if there's anything I can add, I'll add it, but I'll leave this to you. Yeah. Okay. Ask, yeah, the alias, the email alias is ask at tfltruck.com. And these are the six most recent questions that we received. By the way, guys, thank you for sending them in. Uh, first question comes from Jeff Dean. He says, love the videos and extensive uh, comparisons you guys do. I have a 2008 F-250 6.7 liter. I think he means a 6.4 liter, actually. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> uh, and I'm considering upgrading it to a 2020 7.3 liter gas V8. However, I pull a 13,000-pound fifth wheel and was wondering about your experience with going from a stop to about 45 miles an hour to 55 miles an hour. I already feel like the uh, diesel engine that he has in his 08 truck is working to get to those speeds. And if the 
2.3 liter uh, will have even more trouble doing it with a 10 speed. So, Mr. Chuck, what do you think about pulling 13,000 pounds with the new Godzilla? By the way, Andrew, what, what are the uh, horsepower and torque numbers on Godzilla? So, yeah, so the brand new engine that came out this yeah. year just a f- few months ago. It's 430 horsepower and 475 pound-feet of torque. This is for a gas V engine, non-turbo. Super duty. Super duty. Uh, this is F250 and F350 and so on. And 10-speed automatic. What do you think, Ken? Is that, is that too much weight for that 7.3, 13,000 pounds? I think depending if you get the F250 or 350, you're like at, what, fourteen to 17,000 pounds of towing capacity on that truck. Oh, the 7.3 is totally equal to the mass of the 13,000-pound trailer. If you get the 430, you'll be surprised at the acceleration. And we've done them both with the 355 and the three, the 430. And the 430, of course, is the powerhouse and gives that higher tow rating. But if it depends on how often you're towing and all that. 13,000, you could probably get by with that 355. But, you know, it depends if you're in flat ground, if you're in the hills, you know, climbing the mountains. But the, the, the one of the 430 in the mountains impresses me. Actually, is the fastest of the heavy-duty gases that we tested. And that gas engine, it's, you know, we've all been waiting for this a long time. It's kind of an old-school engine. And a 10-speed, you know, that's part of always what we argue about during the, the IAC is whether it's better going downhill or better going uphill. And you want all the braking power you can, but that 7.3 going uphill, because of those 10 gears, you can catch the next gear quicker. And so that keeps your RPMs up. So that's why semis have 18 speeds or 11 speeds or whatever they have. And that, uh, no, I think you'd be fine with that. It's it just going to figure out what kind of topography you drive on, whether or not you should get the 65 axle or the 430 axle. Yeah, I think, you know, I, it's nice to have an old school pushrod V8 back in uh, a Ford vehicle. Uh, and I, I tend to agree with you. And I think that engine is plenty powerful. You know, I think Ford actually in some ways underrates that engine. Uh, because they want longevity. Uh, we'll see. It's too early. I mean, it's only been in, you know in the market for like three months now. Uh, but uh, you know, we, it's too early to tell them longevity. But I think it it certainly has a lot more power to give if you actually wanted to do something with it. What do you think, Andre? I think the thirteen thousand pound trailer that uh, Jeff here is um, asking about uh, the seven three will be great for it, especially like Mr. Chuck said for. 30 rear differential ratio if you are towing often. If you're not towing often, maybe you can get away with a 355 uh, rear end. But I, I think there's a major shift happening in heavy-duty trucks yep. because diesel engines are still quite expensive. Uh, between the 7.3-liter gas V8, if you want to step up to the big diesel in a heavy-duty truck, you have to pay an additional about 9000 bucks. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that 7.3 is $2,000, which used to seem expensive. It isn't now. Yeah. But, uh, so there is a big shift uh, where the new gas engines are getting better. The diesel engines are amazing, but the price difference is still big. So I think what we're seeing here is that more gas engines are capable to do the tasks uh, like Jeff is talking about. So maybe you can save some money and get a gas engine and be happy. You know, I love the diesels, guys, but... If you're not towing, uh, they're just uh, big, heavy. Kind I mean, of, they're fun. They're fun if you can afford it. If you, yeah, uh, yeah, they're just big, heavy, kind of luggy things, uh, and you really feel like you're, you know, you're driving a big boy truck. And sometimes when you're not towing, you don't need to be driving a big boy truck. All right. Uh, second question comes from Brenner Perryman. Um, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, he says, uh, "Hey guys, love your videos. I drive myself crazy researching trucks. Well, that's great. Yeah." So do we. Uh, I have a 2016 Toyota Tundra Limited. Love the truck. It's bulletproof, but I purchased a relatively small travel trailer weighing around 3,800 pounds with about 520-pound tongue weight. This is unladen. What I have come to find after purchasing the travel trailer is that my Tundra really, really does not have much payload capability, around 1,200 pounds of payload, he says. And the payload is a big limiting factor. And this travel trailer is probably too much weight once I load it up and also put my family in the truck. Um, I probably want to get something else. Uh, which truck? And he's looking at the Ford F-250, for example, to replace his Tundra. Uh, and I think uh, Brenner's been watching a lot of our videos. Yeah, dude, I mean, sounds like you're looking for an excuse to get a new truck, if I'm being honest. If you can't tow a 3,500-pound travel trailer with a Tundra, no matter how, how you're probably not trying hard enough, I would say. Now, wait a minute. That Tundra has a 430 rear end if it's got the big V8, so that's amazing he doesn't. But he's right. Payload is a big deal there because 
they, they, they've changed a lot and they rate these trucks. It used to be, you know, they give you enough payload to pull the biggest trailer they ask you to. Well, now you can't. A lot of times that max trailer that they'll tell you about will have too high a ton weight. To you, you and all the family in the trailer, you run out of payload. And if that seems to be the problem, but going to a heavy duty is not a bad idea. And, you know, it's, that's how all those numbers work. It's good you're doing the research on it. But, uh, yeah, that, uh, a lot of half tons would pull that. But, uh, you know, it depends on, you know, how much you, you, you're talking about loading up that truck quite a bit. It wouldn't so, help. It wouldn't hurt the, the, the rule, next, next the rule class of thumb, up. The rule of thumb is what, 10% is what your, your, your tongue, weight. tongue yeah. weight is, right? Tongue so, weight, yeah, yeah. 10, to, 10 to 15. But, you know, too, on that, if you get a basic truck, not a real loaded truck, you can also increase your payload that way. There's a lot of trucks out there right. that are the base work truck that will give you more payload. So you don't have to get away from a half ton. But you do want to get the right gaxle ratio and a few other things. But, uh well, That's one way to get a higher payload. Well, you can Mr. Get a two-wheel drive too. That makes a big difference. If you yeah, want payload, abs- absolutely. But Mr. Shark, would, would you recommend maybe like a helper spring uh, to Brenner? You know, maybe like a sumo spring or a, something else to just kind of add some capability uh, on the on the rear. Dude, he wants a new truck. Well, what it, what what it adds? It adds uh, you know, the ability of the truck, but it doesn't add what the factory says it'll tow. So you can do a lot of things to level the truck out, keep it from squatting. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you change the payload on what the factory says, and that's part that gets you into trouble. I mean, a lot of people need to get some kind of a helper system to level out the truck and not squat, and you know, have better control and better distribution of the weight. And I, I don't know if he's using a weight distributing weight, but you would think that would help him also to use a good weight distributing weight with sway control. But uh, yeah, I, I that are, you got several answers to that question that would work. Uh, you know, and like what Roman said, get a two-wheel drive, get a, a more of a basic truck, and uh, it all depends. You know, it's always about dollars and cents. I love the big heavy-duty trucks, but if you're using it for a daily driver, they get some pretty expensive fuel mileage on them. So, yeah, guys, you know, I, I, I read today that with what's happening in the world, gas is going to be below a dollar a gallon. So maybe <laughs> fuel pricing isn't the big limiter. But, you know, park even just parking a heavy-duty truck is problematic, especially if you're anywhere. Big. Yeah, yeah, in, in, in any kind of suburban or, you know, city. Good God. All right, Andre, what's next? What do you got? Well, I have a kind of a, a slightly longer question from Gene Nardone. Hey, Gene. Um, so thank you, Gene, for sending this question. Uh, this is a little bit of a story, but it's an interesting story. First of all, thank you for the content. I absolutely love the tests and the truck uh, videos. Here's my question. Last Friday evening, while my 19-year-old son and I were replacing a catalytic converter in his Frontier, I loaned him my 2009 Chevy 2500 heavy-duty truck. It's a 4x4 diesel. It only had about 101,000 miles on it. I say had because on his way home in traffic, he re-rendered the F2000 uh, F250 and the both trucks were totaled, unfortunately. Nobody was hurt, so that's good to know. We had a full coverage on the truck, and after a $1,000 deductible, he thinks he can get about $32,000 for his old truck from the insurance company. And he has a 26-foot toy hauler, which weighs around 11,500 pounds. So basically the question is, he has $32,000 from the insurance on the old truck. He wants to add a couple more thousand dollars to it and buy a new truck. And he's looking at a three-quarter ton, like a 2,500. And he says, Chevy, Ram, or Ford. So, Mr. Truck, a used truck, heavy duty, uh, which brand would you recommend for about 40 thousand maybe less than forty thousand well now too does he it was the old one a four-wheel drive i guess it is yeah it shows the yeah. uh the old nine yeah ah you know that <laughs> that's a tough question <laughs> you're, you're you're getting into religion now because these people if their granddad had a dodge they're gonna want a dodge if their granddad had a chevy they're gonna want a chevy so you gotta get past all those kind of opinions but you know there, there's so many answers again to that question it's not a really heavy trailer but uh, getting that price, that's, that's a little different, too. We don't know what part of the country he works or he lives in. Like, it would be cheaper in Texas to buy a truck and not cheaper in, like, New York. So if we're trying to figure out a dollar amount, that's, uh, that's going to be a little tricky. But, uh, I well, mean, you know, he, there's going to be more used Ford trucks out there than Indian because they sell the most. So that's one thing to look at. They'll have a bigger variety if you're looking at a Ford 250. But it doesn't mean there's a lot of the capable trucks out there. Uh, you know, I mean, if, you go, if he's... You can't get the six two and a three quarter ton. You get the six liter. So Chevy, now you got the uh, 
the bigger engine, the 6.6. So you finally got some good pulling power there. It just it has a six-speed automatic. So getting an older Chevy with that six-liter with a 410 will work. It's not my favorite combination. And, uh, you know, the, the Ram course has a 6.4. And if you get new enough, you get that eight-speed, and they do really well. So, uh, you know, what he had was, was a Chevy was the four, so a lot of times you're kind of liking your last truck. Or, right, I'm, or, I'm going to hijack this question a little bit, Andre. Yes, go ahead. Right. So, you know, here, usually the rule of thumb is this. When people ask us what truck they should buy, they always have one in mind, and then uh, they want us in some ways to guess at it and then not tell them which one they should buy but reaffirm the decision they've already made, Right. So we're not here for the most part telling them what truck to buy. We're here telling them that they're going to that they're buying the right truck. And I think he's made up his mind. Right. He it sounds like he wants a Ford and I think that that's a perfectly fine truck. But let's talk about new trucks. So if I were getting a 1500 today, a full-size truck, here here's my rule of thumb. I would say if you want the best interior, all right, go for the Ram. Is that fair? Absolutely. I okay. mean, their interiors I love, are... Yeah, yeah, I love the Rebel interior. All right. Yeah. All right. If you want a turbo, and that's important to you because you're, you know, either living in the mountains or you want to be able to tune it, go for a Ford, right? Because they've got the 2.7 and the 3.5. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want a small turbo or a straight six turbo... Go diesel. F- diesel. Go for the Chevy. Yes. So, because Chevy's got that little four cylinder, four banger, which is really fun around town for a full size truck. Or I think they've right now got the best uh, straight six that full diesel size. That's den- dynamite. Right. Yeah. And we're only talking about full sizes here. Now, um, if you want, and this is going to be a little bit cliche, but it's probably true just because it's been around so long, <laughs> the most reliable truck, mm-hmm. and you don't necessarily care about having the greatest and latest gizmos, go for the uh, Toyota Tundra. And if you want probably the most um, bang for your buck, go for the Nissan Titan. And also the best sounding V8. The best sounding V8. In and the more, most horsepower for a. Yeah. So that would be kind of my quick guide to full size truck buying today. How, and, about, how about you guys? And if I can add just one more point to this. So Gene has about a budget of about 40000 Yeah. And he's looking for a used heavy-duty truck. Well, $40,000 could buy you a brand-new full-size truck, like you said, a brand-new half-ton. Oh, for sure. Uh, you Especially know, we now. Ju- we just basically we just bought a trail bus uh, around that, well, a little bit more. But, but still, you can, be, you can buy a very capable, very capable new truck. Or maybe like a lease return, maybe something a little bit newer, um, not, not maybe two years old, um, for the same budget that he currently has. Because if he buys a truck that's four years old, let's say, yeah. and it has some hidden problem stashed inside of it, you know, maybe somebody abused it, maybe somebody you know, overloaded it, that's still not a great solution. Nope, that's not a great solution. Well, yeah, and if you remember the book that Andre and I wrote, we talked about it in there with Truck nuts. Uh, even even a two year old yes. truck with rebates, with all the things involved, you can get a new truck. Tommy, can you get the book here? Price. <laughs> we got we got we got to show it on camera. <laughs> truck nuts. We we have it in the studio. Yeah, we should have put it yeah. up on the table. Uh, which which, that's, which, that's which my which, thinking exactly. That new truck sometimes <laughs> won't cost you any more than that used one. All right. Uh, before we uh, end this first episode of uh, of uh, TFL talking trucks, boys, let, let me ask you a quick question. Uh, what's your favorite new truck gadget or toy or feature? Let's go down. Let's start with you, Andre, and then I'll go to Kent, and I'll finish it up. So what do you think? What's your new f- kind of favorite newfangled thing you can get on a truck today? Ooh, there's so much. Oh, let me think. Let me think. I think uh, th- tailgates. Oh, tailgates. Tailgates. <laughs> we recently did a tailgate war uh, on a truck. Uh, we compared three of them. We got a GM GMC Sierra with a multi-pro folding tailgate. We had a Ram with a multi-function tailgate. The barn door. Barn door style. And we had a Ford with a tailgate step uh, built right in. And there is other solutions like the Honda Ridgeline swing tailgate. And um, I, I think uh, I'm being a little – I mean, I'm kidding a little bit because at some point uh, you have to decide, is it worth paying extra for that fancy tailgate? Uh, but if you actually, um, you know, want to have fun with your truck, maybe go to some, you know, parties, tailgate gatherings, camping, etc. I think those tailgates with built-in stereo systems, I think that's really fun. I, I'm glad that manufacturers are actually kind of 
thinking a little bit more outside the box and the tailgate and actually innovating in this space. And how about you, Ken? What's your favorite new feature? Well, uh, you know, adaptive control has been around for a while, so it's hard to say that. But, you know, what's really impressed me with RAM in this last year is it's got that power spotter mirror. Now, if you're towing trailers and you want to see what's going on there, you sometimes your spotter mirror isn't exactly where you want for turning that corner and looking at the tail end of the trailer and your axles. I love that you've got a power spotter mirror. That's new with RAM. And then the other one, of course, technology rules now with the cameras. They do so many cool things for turning corners. But with RAM, too, when you jump in the truck, take off with your trailer, turn the first corner, all those cameras measure how long the trailer is. And then hey, you just took you just that. you just took my I, I you took I'm my sorry. oh that's all right <laughs> I love that we just we just towed a, a Polaris to uh, uh, Moab with the Trail Boss the new Silverado and and the, our old Ram Rebel had that feature and I really miss it it's a really cool feature where you just jump in the truck and it knows how long of a trailer you are towing and it does the blind spot monitoring just for that that's so cool. Yeah, it's just you're basically using the radar sensors. Right. When you turn the truck, it can see the trailer and can estimate its length. That's a really cool feature. And you know, the other thing the Silverado doesn't do, which the Ram does, once you've plugged in, it automatically knows and puts it in tow haul mode. Whereas the Silverado, you still have to manually select tow haul mode. And I'm like, why doesn't the truck know if I've got a plug into the back of its butt, right, that, <laughs> that it has t- <laughs> tow haul mode? <laughs> well, yeah, they're all, they're all getting better at that. It used to be you always had to turn the tow haul mode in the, in the uh, turbo the uh, exhaust brake. called the exhaust brake on yeah. now a lot of them will stay on after you get out which is kind of nice because we're always fumbling to try to remember where the switch is on this truck because they're all a little different but yeah it's it's getting easier i mean it's it's and amazing that, what technology is done to these trucks and i think and if just one final point uh, uh i think owning a truck is also a lot about independence you know a lot of uh working guys also work by themselves uh, a lot of the time and if a truck can help you complete your job, maybe a button that lowers your tailgate without you getting out, or maybe hooking up a plow, a snow plow in an easier way, I mean, all those things help. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff, like you know the fact that you can now lock the tailgate with the key fob, basically. Uh, the dampened tailgate is really cool. That's come into its own. But my favorite feature, I think, the newest technology, which I think really actually works, because you got to test it, Andre. I had to film it, is in the new Raptor, those live wire Fox shocks, right, mm-hmm. that you can actually uh, adjust so that if you're, like, jumping the truck, it knows it's flying in air, and it'll firm up those shocks, so when you hit, you don't hit your bump stops. I mean, those, shocks, those shocks are really cool. And I think... We just tested them in the Polaris, uh, and I think those are coming to a lot more uh, things in the near future. And the REM TRX is coming. And yeah. the but, you know, all, all that stuff is cool, but nothing beats the massaging seat and the floor. <laughs> and the nothing beats that. <laughs> oh, God. That they roll across your back and your behind is just wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Or, or a heated steering wheel, right? When it's cold, when you can just wrap your fingers yeah. around that thing. Yeah, Damn, dude, the, okay. the, the Rams will burn your fingers off. They're so hot. Yeah, yeah. They come on automatically when it's cold, dude. But yeah. And on that note, on that note, we're going to say thank you for spending this last 45 minutes or so with us. Uh, and don't forget, if you haven't done so, subscribe. And if you're listening to this podcast, we thank you for jumping in, being one of the first to listen. And uh, hopefully uh, this will continue next week when we'll be talking about uh, this year's uh, hopeful gold hitch awards. Yeah, more specifically. Yeah, more specifically, yeah. which trucks did the best and which trucks did the worst in all of our testing. Uh, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Thank you, uh, Andre. Thank you, Kent, for taking the time. And thank you guys yeah. for joining us. And if you have any comments about how to make the show better, let us know below. And Mr. Truck, how do they find you? Oh, I'm hanging out at MrTruck.com and MrTruck.tv. That's just where I live. Oh, okay. Which is like 60 miles away, so it's pretty far. (laughs) Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Ciao. Thank you very much. Thanks. I can see Russia from here. No, 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 no. (laughs) 